Antonio de Ulloa of Spain was only 19 years of age when he was promoted to the rank of frigate lieutenant and sent on what would be a life-altering expedition to Quito in Ecuador, led by French geographers Charles-Marie de la Condamine and Pierre Bouguet. Antonio departed Spain in May of 1735, not knowing he wouldn't see his motherland again for more than a decade. The mission was a monumental one, to help determine whether the Earth was flat, as was popularly believed throughout most of human history up to that point, or whether it was a sphere, as suggested by Sir Isaac Newton. To this end, it was necessary to measure the length of a degree of longitude at the equator, of which Quito was the closest city, and again it's somewhere as near as possible to one of the poles. An expedition to the far north of Sweden was also dispatched for this purpose, but our story shall leave that journey to the pages of history. As Antonio accompanied the geographers in Ecuador, their task proved epic indeed, and with great struggle, they finally completed their work around 1745. Over the course of this decade, Antonio had plenty of time to explore the territory and the people there, recording his more interesting observations in various papers he carried with him. As the expedition finally departed back to Spain, their mission accomplished, Antonio must have been filled with strong emotions, as he was at long last headed home. Fate, however, had other plans in store for him. As they made their way, sailing around Cape Horn, they were chased down north of the Azores by an English privateer and their ship was captured. However, they managed an escape, and as luck seemed to be on their side, they evaded their captors and seemed to leave danger behind. But God seemed intent to test their wills, and as they reached Louisburg in Nova Scotia, their vessel was once again captured, this time by a British naval vessel, and escape was out of the question. Antonio and his companions were taken to London and imprisoned, while the Admiralty confiscated nearly a decade's worth of notes from Antonio's time spent in Ecuador. Things looked grim for our frigate lieutenant as he sat in a cell awaiting his fate. But when God closes a door, he is known to open a window, and good fortune came in the form of the president of the Royal Society, Martin Folkes, who came to know Antonio and his story and befriended him. The Royal Society were a group of natural philosophers and physicians, and not only did Martin free Antonio from his chains, he got all his papers returned to him and even made him a fellow of the Royal Society in 1746. He was then allowed to return to Spain. Finally back after his long mission, he set to work compiling an account of his adventures which he published in 1748, first in Spanish and then had it translated into several other languages. For the purposes of our subject today, one passage in particular stands out. In the district of Choco are many mines of lavadero, or wash gold. Several of the mines have been abandoned on account of the platina, a substance of such resistance that when struck on an anvil of steel, it is not easy to be separated, nor is it calcinable, so that the metal enclosed within this obdurate body could only be extracted with infinite labor and charge. Shortly after releasing his book, Antonio was tasked with a new mission by the King of Spain himself, King Ferdinand VI, to travel throughout Europe and study scientific developments across the continent. His travels brought him to Sweden in the autumn of 1751, and he was welcomed with open arms by Swedish scientists. Shortly after his arrival, he was duly elected to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in October of the same year. During his time there, he met with mathematician and chemist H.T. Scheffer. Scheffer was a former mine and metalworks manager, as well as an assayer at the Mint, and so had quite a vested interest in metals. There is no official record of what exactly was said in that meeting, but shortly thereafter, in November of 1751, Scheffer produced a paper titled The White Gold, or Seventh Metal, called in Spain Platina del Pinto, Little Silver of Pinto, Its Nature Described, and submitted it to the Academy. Scheffer was already familiar with platinum before encountering Antonio, as he himself had received samples of it just a year earlier in 1750 from the West Indies, but his time with Antonio undoubtedly influenced his writing. In the paper, he came to the following conclusions about platinum. 
that this is a metal hard but malleable, but of the hardness of malleable iron, that it is a precious metal of durability, like gold and silver, that it is not any of the six old metals, since first, it is wholly and entirely a precious metal, containing nothing of copper, tin, lead, or iron, because it allows nothing to be taken from it. It is not silver, nor is it gold, but it is a seventh metal, among those which are known up till now in all lands. In addition, he recommended a potential practical application for platinum when he wrote, this metal is the most suitable of all to make telescope mirrors, because it resists as well as gold the vapors of the air. It is very heavy, very dense, colorless, and much heavier than ordinary gold, which is rendered unsuitable for this particular use by lacking these two latter properties. Although attempts were made in the years that followed, platinum never found its place in telescopes of the era. Although Scheffer would be delighted to know, the metal did eventually find use in the construction of X-ray telescopes centuries later. Nonetheless, his paper sparked the imaginations of scientists across the world, and a flurry of research into platinum began, leading it to be established as the multifaceted metal that we know in the modern era. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.